This episode is sponsored by Furniture Box. Check them out in the description below. I'm probably a little bit of a lone wolf, to be honest with you. James Constantinou, founder of Prestige Porn Brokers. What do you think is the craziest thing that you've ever pawned? It's not always about the value of, or even the brand. It's sometimes, it's just the unusual stuff that comes yeah. out of like Queen Victoria's underpants. <laughs> wait, 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 wow. wait, wait, wait. Okay, <laughs> let's go, <laughs> let's just go back for a second there. Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones, some letters that he sent, I reckon we're gonna be really famous soon. Do you get people coming in often trying to bring in like fake shit? I can't say I've never been caught out by it. Your business is probably like a um, canary in the coal mine. Yeah, we're definitely a barometer in terms of that i think it in my head and then about two weeks later we see it on the news channel four how'd that come about as soon as that show went out and their phone started ringing their whole perception changed have you thought about going international it's a very different type of business in america what do you think about crypto but to me it scares the life out of me. could you have started a bit less we couldn't go do you have any advice for sort of certain uh career paths or skill set to get that initial sort of chunk of cash i've just told the guys today Welcome back to The Ground Floor, the show where we ask successful people exactly how they did it. Our guest today is James Constantinou, founder of Prestige Porn Brokers and the host of Posh Porn, the Channel 4 documentary on uh, on his own porn shop empire. So uh, James, good to be here, man. Thanks, thanks for having me. No, pleasure. Great no, to have pleasure. you along. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know you, do you want to sort of give a quick summary of your, sort of your story and who you are? Okay, well, I'm uh, James. I started a pawnbroking business in 2009. It was sort of aimed at the high end of the spectrum, which really didn't exist in the UK. So we set out to just sort of set up a business where people could bring in high end, high value items to us, whether it was a piece of art, cars, car collections, um, and things really the... Um, traditional pawnbrokers were sort of shying away from. We thought mm. there was a need for that type of lending. Obviously, it came on the back of the Lehman Brothers and all the banks tightening up. They weren't lending to the general public. I had lots of friends that couldn't get hold of money. They lived in three and four, five million pound houses, but literally didn't have the money to put their children through schooling. So it was a very odd situation. Mm. And I was quite fortunate. Um, I'd finish some uh, developments. So I was uh, building houses and I had some cash and I was just looking and itching for something else to do, really. That's how it all came about. And you got out at the right time. Yeah, I mean, timing was fantastic, really. You couldn't wish for it. I mean, now is, now at this particular time is a sort of, yeah. I'm sort of looking at it and it feels like very much that 2008, 2009 feel about it, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts actually on where we are. Yeah, with, with, with yeah, that. I'd like to touch on that. I would like to touch sure. on that because it'd be interesting. So in terms of uh, the industry as a whole, um, you said you're in development before. Yes. Well, so, I still, I've still got a development company. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, going back to the very beginning, sort of making your initial money in order to set that business up, how did you get into development in the beginning? Um, well, it was sort of, that was on the crash of the like, late 80s, really. They were doing, offering some really good buy to let deals. Hmm. I was dealing in classic cars, um, doing quite well. Uh, and I thought, actually, I could apply this where I buy an old rusty car and make it look beautiful. I could apply that and do it with property. And that's mm. really what I did. I had sort of put all my life savings in, uh, sold my house, moved back in with my parents for six months, and oh, I went wow. started okay. going to the property auctions. Okay. So you went all in from day Well, I mean, it was, yeah, you've got yeah. to really, especially if you're, it's not like you're going to buy, I don't know, uh, some coins or stamp. You really, with something like that, you mm. need to get hold of quite a, a fair chunk of money and sure. I've, I've, the only way to do it for me at that time was I, I just looked out on the drive one day I had about six old cars out there Jaguars and mm. um, MGs and Mercedes and I thought I'm going to sell everything I'm going to sell the house I'm going to sort of almost be homeless for a little while and I'm wow. going to put everything into property development and it worked I mean again it was all about the timing it was sure. on the I think it was at 91 or the market was really flat but the actual mortgage deals that were available the buy to lets. Mm. I mean, there was a, a thing called a cashback where you put down, I think on one property, I put down £5,000 and I got 3800 back. Wow. Those were the so days. For, okay. So for 1200 quid, I owned yeah. a house. I wow. Mean, right. And I think I did three or four of them in the space of six months. And so really the beginning of it was the, it was a rental portfolio. Okay. 
So although I did flip a couple early on, really uh, to get into the market was a rental portfolio that I built up over probably about six years. Right. And how did you how did you source those deals? For anybody listening that's maybe quite interested in property development side or the property development side, how did you actually source the properties? What did you look for? Initially, I was looking at, I, when I was talking to agents that uh, were in touch with um, vendors that wanted to move quite quickly because I was able to, I didn't have anything to sell. Um, and that was one way. And I was going to the property auction. So the big, you know, all sort part of Marcus, those sort of typical uh, places that you might look. And I was also looking at the areas where I felt they were quite near universities or uh, institutions that were, you know, where you might be able to rent to students mm -hmm. and, and, and do it that way. And that's how I initially got into it. Um, and as I said, once I built up, I think I got to about 12 properties. And then I started okay. to look at um development because i thought actually look if i can refurbish one everyone said that refurbishment was more difficult or more costly than actually building from new so i thought i'd give it a go building from new i always wanted to uh build my own home so i i bought some land and that's how i got okay. into that so and we've been doing it ever since and so what year did you did you actually set up the pawn shop business 2009 we were operating by sort of may so on the back of the 2008 crash right sort of in, by the time we looked into it investigated how to get a a lending a sure. license um get okay. fca regulated and how much capital did you start with probably about four or five hundred thousand right was the sort of yeah. sunk into it it was very i mean it it was slow initially to um get going because uh, not because there wasn't a need for it but because people didn't know about it mm, of course so obviously when channel four come along and made the show that was a total different that was a different yeah, ball yeah. game but until then it was very difficult for me to tell people if you've got a car on your driveway mm. and you haven't got any money, you can bring that car into me. Right. True, that's yeah, hard. Um, oh. Or if you've got a piece of art or you've got a Banksy or something like that, or you've had some art in your family. Are people pawning a Banksy? Well, yeah. I mean, it happened. I mean, I've got two in now. Really? Uh, yeah, that came in within the last two weeks. So Banksy is a typical one that we see quite a lot. It's and probably the most famous. Wow. Just kind of on that point, how often is it that people come back to get those products versus you actually keeping them and ending up having to sell them on yourself? Um, I'd say, well, it's about 84% it's running it. Right. Yeah, so 84% of the people that come in, come. In, I mean, we don't want to, I don't want to be a shopkeeper. Yeah. So selling items that belong to people is not really what I set out to do. Um, Could you just explain to people who might not understand what pawn shops are? And for anyone who might be absolutely lost, when I say pawn, I'm saying P-A-W-N. Yeah, He's not selling an adult bookstore. No. <laughs> um, but when for anyone that might not understand the pawn industry, can you explain exactly what the business model is? Okay, so um, in the same way uh, a bank might lend you money secured against your house, I would lend you money secured against your luxury assets, whether it be a wine collection, an art collection, or a piece of art, or your watch, your jewellery, your gold, your um, cars, uh, almost anything that you've got of value. And that's um, what we do. And we sort of pride ourselves on being able to do it very quickly. So you, it's not uh, there's no credit checks. We're not really um, interested in any CCJs. We do our obviously background checks on the client to make sure he his uh, the person is who they say they are they live at that address and they are, and we do our best to make sure that they own the asset they're bring, bringing into us that's important to us obviously mm. um and usually we can facilitate a loan i mean i've put 200 300 grand into people's bank accounts within 24 hours wow so that can't be done um by the sort of major institutions or a bank it's impossible the other thing is to consider which is people do get surprised on is the it's actually cheaper to borrow from us than it is for a, for a bank for two months the past two months it's more expensive i can't pretend right. it isn't but if you wanted to borrow say 100 grand at 2.9 percent if you only need it for a month or two you would never get that facility and you would know and your fees your setup fees alone would be more than the 2.9 percent right so that's an interesting point so because we do a lot of bridging so people come into us and they or it's pawnbroking, but they, mm. you know, they want it. They want a bridge in effect, so they're waiting for a property to sell, and then they're buying another property, but the property hasn't uh, completed mm. or things like that. So we mm. get that quite often, and they come in, and quite often we hear, "Oh, well, that was the cheapest hundred, two hundred grand I've mm. ever borrowed." Mm. If it's short term, yeah. And so, and it, I, sorry, I was just, no, I was going to say, how does it work in terms of like, so let's say you hold it for a bit longer, how do you determine? Okay, we're holding it for this long and just charging more interest, and then how do you determine we're holding it and now we're going to actually have to sell it and take the money from it? Okay, so. Going back to your original point, how does it actually physically work? So yeah. Someone will bring in an item, say it's worth a hundred thousand right. pounds. Um, when I'm taking, when I talk about value, I don't talk about the retail value. I talk about what is it worth today. If I was to sell it, 
on the open market or if it was having to be sold through one of the big auction houses, say Bonhams or Sotheby's, if it made £100,000 minus the fees, let's just say it's 90000 I would lend a percentage of that 90000 Right. Usually around between 55 and 70%. So in the interest, it's all bespoke. So the interest varies depending on the asset and the saleability of the item. So there's quite a lot involved in, but what you really want at the end of the day, what you want to be doing is at the end of the seven month contract, you want the client to be owing you a little bit less than the item's worth because you want them to come in and collect it. Right. That's the idea. Mm. So, you know, I mean, it's very difficult in a market where everything's turbulent, you know, where you see assets going up and down like we did at the moment. So during the pandemic, for example, Rolex watches were trebling. Mm. You know, we had some Rolex watches that were 40, 50 grand new that were being sold for 200 grand. Wow. It was crazy. I mean, there were a lot of people. And I mean, uh, the online sales for luxury assets through the pandemic went absolutely crazy as well. Mm. Is there is there a rule where sort of you're not allowed to sell it earlier? So in a case like that with the Rolex situation where you're like, wow, these are selling like hotcakes for way more. I could just sell it in the first, second or third month. Well, I mean, the other point is, and it's probably quite interesting for your listeners, is that um, we don't ever own the item. The uh, the the person who's pledged the goods to us have owned the item throughout the whole contract, even at the point of sale. So all the contract does is give us the right after seven months to sell, to facilitate the sale of that, okay. that item and recoup our funds. That's all it is. Right. I mean, I don't want to sell. As I said, I, there's no there's no point in me selling people's goods. We've often come to the end of a contract and I've phoned a client and said, listen, look, it's come to the end. We have, you haven't been in touch. What do you want to do? If they can say to me, Oh, well, in two months' time, I've got some money coming. I'd much rather extend it. Yeah, because, I'm with you. Because that we've seen clients come back, you know, three or four times over the years, and it's much more it makes better business for us. We spend so much money on advertising Google and we put so much effort into the a posh porn TV show. Why would we want to sell someone's goods yeah. so they could never return to us again? Because sure. no one's got an endless pot of goods. No, I can understand yeah. that. Um I mean, going back to the beginning then that we discussed, how did you actually market the product? So the business and actually you know, get your name out there. Yeah, I mean, I'd always sort of, when I left school, I was always buying and selling stuff, whether it was cars. I mean, there was all, I was in India, I was buying container loads of furniture, bringing them back. I was always, I wasn't really shy about um, getting involved in the buying and selling of almost anything. And this business really appealed to me because I thought, actually, I've got that pot of money there and uh, there's an opportunity. And I've sort of, I read something in, I think it was the uh, Times on Sunday, I was flicking through. Uh, and as I said, I didn't really, wasn't really, I just finished a, a development project and I saw something about in America that there was a bank, um, offering loans against art collections. And I thought, well, why don't they do, why is it in America and why is it in the newspaper? Why is that such a big surprise to me? I, I didn't, I didn't know why it wasn't a, a more general thing and against, and people weren't doing it against other assets. That's how the idea came to me with the actual setup. I really didn't know anything about it i would just we thought i said to a friend of mine i said do you fancy getting involved with pawnbroking and she said it's joe who was on the show with me and i'd known her since she was 17 she said well what do you know about pawnbroking i said well i don't know anything that's why i'm asking <laughs> yeah. you to have a look at it for me so we can anyway she come back to me after about a week she said well i phoned up the national pawnbrokers association apparently you can apply for a license i said okay let's have a little look see if there's any premises she said, well, where are you looking? I think, well, I think Weybridge would be quite nice because that's, you know, it's, there's assets here. Yeah. Um, and it did actually surprise a lot of people that I thought that Weybridge might be okay. But I mean, for obvious reasons, mm. so you you know, it is okay because you've got people Yeah, it's there. an affluent area. It's an affluent got, area and you're lending against affluent. You've got, yeah. Well, you know, you've got Ferrari, you've got all the traffic yeah. going past. Yeah. There, the assets are there. So that's where we, um, and it's really weird because there was a little old hat shop. It's a tiny little thing, about probably a third of the size of this room. So, we went in there with the agent um, and we walked down the back and there was this big old vault at the back. Of big, and I said, why is there a vault in a hat shop? And they said, oh, well, the guy who owned this had a pawnbroker's in the 70s and he now he's now got his own bank. And it was like a little... <laughs> thing. That's a sign. Yeah. yeah, yeah so a I sign. Thought, right, this is the shop. Yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, within about sort of six weeks, we were trading from there. And as I said, it was very slow. I mean, I employed a, a jeweler because... Most of the assets that you see on a daily basis are sort of jewelry based, whether it's a watch or you mm. know, a, or a, a diamond ring or a necklace. It's that those sort of assets. I knew that I could take care of the cars, and I had family connections with wine, and I had a friend who was an art dealer. So I thought I could 
sort of bat that away. So you relied on them for the valuations? Relied on that for the okay. uh, them for the valuations. I mean, the mechanics of it, we sort of really made up as we yeah. what the checks were going to do and on the piece of art. And we did make mistakes at the yeah. beginning. Sure. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there was um, we've tightened up our processes so much since then. But um, at the beginning, we had to find our feet. And that's why I guess a lot of people don't do it. That's why other pawnbrokers aren't involved with it because it is hazardous. There's no doubt about it. But anyway, so we sat there and, you know, we were like looking at the door. No one was coming in. We'd fly, we'd sent leaflets out. I got some kids to put leaflets on everyone who was at the big Tesco's multi-store. Okay, yeah. And they'd been chased out the car park by the, uh, okay. and I said, well, you better go back at night then. <laughs> so we tried everything. <laughs> Don't let that yeah. stop you. Yeah, well, yeah. we tried everything. And then, um, you know, the door opened and some guy coming in and said, uh, what happened to the hairdressers that was here? We said, no, that's next door, mate. So all excited about having a visitor. There was no, yeah. uh, literally no one was coming in. Okay. Anyway, and then what happened is uh, the press, local press got hold of it. And they did an article on high, you know, how this guy had set up this high-end uh, pawnbrokers in Weybridge. It was only a local paper. Anyway, from that day onwards, really, um, it changed what we were doing. So we had a lot of local people coming in. Then the BBC World News got hold of it and they wanted to do a, uh, did an interview on me on uh, World News. And then a news channel from Germany flew over and they did. And pretty quickly, it sort of gathered pace. And then I think wow. Channel 4 within a couple of right. years were sort of keen. It was very topical at that time. With you. Uh, I think it was about 2012 they got in touch. What's interesting as well is the fact that like, it, it was obviously started post-recession. Uh, post and for a lot of businesses, that's a pretty bleak time. You know, it's hard, you know, it's hard mm -hmm. to get loans and it's hard to get things set up and people are tightening their purse strings and not spending as much. But for your industry, mm. that is literally the saving grace. That's like in a time where everyone, quick, quick cash, right? everyone needs quick cash and everyone needs to, you know, bin things off and get some money yeah, in yeah. their hand. Yeah. You're like, I have the place. And the fact that no one was doing it, I mean, that's yeah. a perfect combination. Yeah, I mean, it was very, um, time and it place. was uh, in terms of time and you couldn't really have it any better than what it was, 2000. Yeah. Did and that factor in, by the way, to your, were you thinking this is actually the perfect time to launch it or were I, you just, you were going to launch it regardless? I don't believe I would have even thought of it if it had I not been sitting there looking at, um, listening to these stories of woe and people yeah. not being yeah. able to get their hands on money. Yeah. The idea probably wouldn't have come to my head, to be honest with you. Right. It was only that I actually couldn't believe, well, the banks aren't lending to these people. These are really good, long-standing business people that are respected locally mm. and have done some great things. Half Some people owned half the high street, you know, and they okay. were just struggling to get hold of a few yeah. thousand pounds. Mm. And they were playing golf with the bank managers on Sunday and the bank managers were phoning on Monday saying, no, sorry, I can't lend you any more money. Oh, wow. It was just very odd. It was a very odd time. And I just thought that that was the light bulb moment for me. I had a few hundred grand sitting around and I thought, well, this could be good. And also it really interested me, the business, to be able to mess around with things and touch things that I had only ever dreamt of as yeah, a child. Course, you know, yeah. like, I mean, like Banksy's and stuff. I'm yeah, like, yeah, that's a really cool thing to be Well, I, what I like about it is I don't really, and I don't, claim to understand every asset because you never know what's going to come in yeah. that's the beauty of the business but i really like the sort of investigative side of it and getting the teams oh we look we've got to find out about this we've got to phone him he's the best he's based in america give him a call send him some images ask yeah. his opinion mm. so all that i think is that's really what appeals to me about the business do you remember your first sale first sale um like the first item that you pawned god you know what i can't actually there was uh, i mean we we sort of opened up during the gold rush it was really weird so we used to get bags and bags of gold old got people coming oh, really in. um so there was a lot of gold uh, um it that always sticks in my mind okay and i kept one little thing which is on my key ring over there it's a little gold bulldog with a diamond it's not worth anything it's yeah, probably yeah. worth 500 quid but it always it just reminds me of one of the first things that caught my eye tiny little thing like that yeah but yeah so yeah there's so many bits okay. and pieces coming in We've done some great um, pieces of art. I mean, one piece of art that sticks in my mind are Munnings, which is very well respected. He painted horses. Um, lovely piece of art from a gentleman. Uh, yeah, that was actually a loan. So, yeah, that that uh, sticks with me. But, yeah, that's the, sort of the beginning of the sort of the most impressive. Yeah. I think it's about 60 grand, that piece of art. Are there, and you, yeah, go I was going to say, so you started, you said with a few hundred grand, obviously, from the property business mm. you, that you eventually built up. Could you have started with less? I imagine it's probably quite tricky given the fact that you'd be lending against sort of high end assets, but just curious to see what yeah. you think the minimum would be to. I pretty get much run out of money pretty quickly right. within a few months, to be quite once it got out there. Um, 
after about six months, I was looking to family and friends. I was selling up my property portfolio to throw into the company. You'd need you'd need quite a lot more. Because that's what I mean, yeah. Because you need money for the actual place and yeah. the setup and the staff costs and everything. But then you actually the need money to, money to, to, buy, to, the assets. to buy the assets. Yeah. yeah, loan against the assets. Well, the thing is, I mean, you could have one loan come in. We've got loans now that are four or five hundred grand, just one client. So you know, you couldn't really. I mean, I'm not saying you can't open a pawnbroker's with three or four hundred grand. You can, and a lot of uh, pawnbroking books for single stores are less than that, a lot less. But um, if you want to be high end and you want to, you, you're paying for the, all the advertising. You can't really have someone come in with a collection of coins that's worth mm. half, a quarter of a million quid and say, "I can't service you." Sorry. Yeah. Especially if you're paying for those people yeah, to call you. You know. Yeah. And we spend a lot of money on Google, so we spend probably about half a million pound a year on Google to this day. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah, Interesting. So How many locations do you have now? I've got nine now. Right. Yeah. So we're based around, we're in and around London. We've got a new one um, opened up in uh, opposite Leadenhall Market in the city, which is great. Got all the city guys mm, coming in. Yeah. Um, I mean, the loaning is only one aspect of the business. We buy and sell as well. So we're well uh, known for our um, buying ability in sort of the pre love market. Um, Hermes, Chanel, mm. Rolex, or, uh, Cartier, all the uh, jewelry brands as well. Yeah. So you but do also it. get people that come in and say, I want to sell my Rolex. Oh, 100%. Keep. It's probably about 50 50. Now, right. Actually. Okay. Do you ever have something where someone comes in where they want to loan something and you're holding on to it thinking, I hope this guy doesn't come back for it because I'd love to keep this? Well, there are, that does. Like that bulldog your, thing, for example. Y yes. That, 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 that <laughs> does come into it. Although, you know, in the back of your mind, really, the good business a good business person would be thinking actually i want this person to come back and collect it there's always things i mean when you're in this business if you're interested in those assets i mean i'm not really into i don't wear a watch i'm not into brands uh, as such i can go out and buy a pair of trainers for a ten, or i can go out and spend 500 quid on it. it does not really mm. about the the name it's you know for me it's just if i like something i'll mm. you know i like it but um some people are um you know you can tell those people that are infused by the brands and i I have sort of got to appreciate, although I'm not really into the brands myself um, and I don't find a need to have them, you can now, I do now appreciate quality. So when you hold a Hermes bag that is 50 grand, mm. although initially I thought, why is there a bag 50? Well, what, what's with this? I can go out and buy, you know, a nice E-type Jag for this. Yeah. When you hold something of quality, you do sort of get to appreciate. It is a very weird thing that when you've been surrounded by yeah. it. But Mm. Do you think it clouds your your judgment a little bit when you're actually looking at it from a personal perspective, being just surrounded by that luxury on a daily basis? Well, I think um, I t I tell you what it does. I think it just I just I don't I'm not sort of that impressed by it to be mm. quite honest with you. I mean, I understand the value of it. I can see the quality of it. Mm. But if I see someone with a watch on. I'm not like nudging my friend saying, have you seen that fellow's watch over there? Yeah, yeah, Get yeah, a look yeah. at him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that much to me because I see so much of it on yeah. a daily basis. And when someone brings in a diamond to me now, when I first saw a diamond, a two or three carat diamond, which is quite a big stone, was like, oh my God, have you mm. seen the size of that? What can we lend against that? Now, if I see a nine or 10 carat stone, then it's, wow, have you seen it? So yeah. I think the more you get to see of these things, um, the more... Uh, you just become it's like an everyday sort of experience for me now. Whereas at the beginning, it was so, you know, I was so wowed by everything. Mm. Do you get people? <laughs> do you get people coming in often trying to bring in like fake shit? Had someone today. Really? really? Had someone today. Yeah, keeps bringing. He's done it to me three times. He keeps going to different stores, putting on different accents, using different names. <laughs> really? he's got like these three. He keeps bringing in. Uh, fake Hermes bags. Okay. Right. So I've just told the guys today, they said, oh, so-and-so's back. I said, ban him. Yeah. yeah. They said, well, this time he says he's like, this one is, he didn't know about the first. I said, no, just ban <laughs> yeah, the guy. Yeah. He didn't know about the first time. Yeah, the or the second time. Accident. The second third time, was, time you sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so no, he keeps going around, yeah, to different stuff. But we get that quite a lot, you know. I mean, I don't blame him. I mean, there are people out there that actually make a living. So they've acquired these um knockoffs or fakes if you like and they've not gone they've not got them on the beach and in marbella they've probably gone to a quite a reputable place out in dubai where they make these mm. some of these copies and they've probably paid you know you can pay 500 quid or a thousand pound for a really good copy rolex and they might have invested in four or five they've brought them back to the uk and they're probably going to eventually get rid of them mm. and they're going to make a good wage out of going around, spending their time driving out to the suburbs, yeah. putting on a little cravat and a crombie or whatever, yeah, breaking yeah, themselves yeah. look respectable. Do people do that? 100%. I've really? Had, I've had it. There was a guy, I t I've told the story before, but 
is quite a funny story. There was a guy who turned up in Weybridge and I was working in store and he came in and the guys were going, this guy's good. They were running around. They said, he's got some art. He's in a rush. Um, he's quite important. I said, well, why? And they said, well, he's, he says, have you seen his car? I looked over the road and there was this big Rolls Royce over the road right in view of my store. And instantly alarm bells rang because I've been working there for a year and I've never had a parking space outside my store. Okay. And suddenly this man was able to park his Rolls Royce in my eyesight okay. of the side, I just thought, no, nah, that doesn't that yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Anyway, he came in, he had a, um, a camel coat sort of, oh, uh, and, a, and okay. this flash Crombie. And he started talking about people that he knew and where he'd been on holiday. And I just, I sort of paid him a bit yes, of lip yeah, service. Yeah. I sat him down and he pulled out this piece of art and it looked okay. And he said, but um, James, I've got my, my place down in uh, Kensington. I've got to get back to being for lunch because I'm flying out to Paris. And, and I just thought- Putting pressure on the sale. You're, you're, yeah, you're yeah. talking shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can um, see but, straight through that. But anyway, yeah. but I said, listen, you're going to have to leave it with me. I said, because I'm going to consult some experts. In fact, I've got an expert who deals with this. And once I said that, you can see sort of his bum started twitching. Yeah, and he's yeah, been, yeah. I, I really must get back to Kensington. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, 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 I don't have picture with me, actually. Yeah, right. Consult yeah. with these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he's sort yeah. of scurried out. Never saw him again, but you know, you get the you get these people come in, and some of them probably do quite well out of it. To be quite honest with you, so I'm guessing have you, you been called out by it? Oh, good question. Um, I can't say I've never been called out by it. I'm, yeah. I think there's probably I can I can probably say I'd like to say one hand, but probably now we've been trading for about yeah. uh, twelve or thirteen years. It's probably two hands. I've probably been called out a few times. The problem is, is for them, is the more valuable the item that they bring in, the more checks I'm going to do. Yeah. If there's a mm. something that's four or five hundred quid, it's sort of like, yeah, we think that's all right. That that looks good. If it's an item that's sort of twenty, thirty, forty, or fifty grand, then we're going to do. Yeah. We're going to check yeah. the hell out of it. We're yeah. going to yeah, consult yeah. every expert we can. We're going to drive it all over London if yeah. we have to. That would make sense. Because yeah. one of my questions was actually going to be, how do you maintain quality control when you've opened up nine oh. sites? Because you kind of touched on it there about you've got mm. a, a number of experts that you consult with, but maybe just staff wise as well. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is now, I mean, at the very beginning, I was relying on my sort of instinct and having a, a member of the team there that sort of understand jewelry in general. But now because we've expanded and because of the mainly because of the TV show, we sort of attract the best minds in the business, if you like. So everyone who deals in luxury assets or handles these things, well, not everyone, but a lot of them will be glad to come and work for us because of our reputation. And they also enjoy the sort of autonomy to be able to handle these things. Because if you go to some of these organizations, they don't let the, you're just checking it in. So you're taking it in, you're writing a receipt out, and then you don't have any more responsibility uh, you're not doing any sort of investigative work or mm. look at, or any analysis of that mm. object with my team is i encourage them to look at it come up with their own opinion talk to their colleagues photograph it do all their own work on it and then present their manager or, or me with their findings and then we all sit down together and work out what we're going to do about it right. so i encourage that but i think we have got some really great minds. Uh, we've got gemologists, people who have dealt in art. Some of the guys have worked for some of the big auction houses. So we've got most of it's probably in-house okay. now. But if ever we need to consult, you know, if we had um, a Turner, for, in, for example, and we have had a Turner being presented to us, we will not just do that in-house. We will have to consult someone from the Turner Foundation yeah, or someone with a higher authority um, especially if it's big money. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a second to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Furniture Box. Furniture Box is an online furniture retailer that makes awesome products for everywhere from your bedroom to your office. Now we actually had Monty and Dan, the co-founders on our show. That's how we met. We loved their story and we hung out with them afterwards and we knew that we wanted to work with them. And here's the thing. One of the biggest issues I have whenever I've ordered furniture in the past is that certain big name furniture companies, not naming any names, will charge you a fairly large fee for delivery. And even then that delivery usually takes a few days, if not longer. With Furniture Box, not only do they offer free next day delivery, but they're now planning on extending their delivery cutoff even more so that you can literally order a dining set as late as 8 p.m. and be eating dinner on it the next day. So to put it simply, there's no one in the UK furniture scene that's doing anything like what they're doing, and we're thrilled to have them as our sponsor. So click the link in the description and check them out. Now back to the episode. Channel 4, how'd that come about? Well, that was really weird because... Um, we'd been getting a lot of press. So we were in the papers quite a lot and we were having interviews and it was sort of gathering a bit of pace. And then suddenly this production company phoned up and a guy said, 
uh, would like to make a uh, come down and talk to you. And I said, well, what it's about? Or well, Channel 4 have commissioned us to um, make a, a show about or alternative lending. We've heard what you do. And I said, nah, it's not really for me. I just thought, oh, oh really? some sort of okay. expose, you know, yeah, right. trying to set me up. He said, listen, look, look, please, we just want to, can we just make some notes in the corner and, and just, we're not trying to sort of, it's not a trick. And it's, it's not a gotcha thing. No, that, well, that's the first thing that swings to mind, right? So um, I said to Joe, I said, do you want to let him down, let this guy come down? He said, he just wants to sit in the corner and listen to us. And so she said, oh yeah, all right, I let him in there. So she, he came down, he was a lovely guy. Um, and he come down, he was from Manchester, really nice down to earth fellow. He sat in the corner and he had a bit of pen, and he had a pen and a bit of paper and, um, sort of within about half an hour, we almost forgot he was there. So we started okay. talking and we, me and Joe had quite a good bit of banter. So we were taking the piss out of each other. I think I said her shoes look like a couple of pit of breads. And she said, <laughs> said, said something about me looking a bit overweight. I had a bit of a bay window okay. going on anyway. <laughs> yeah. It was a all bit like, of a bay window. <laughs> yeah, a I've bit, never heard that. So we were just sort of doing this for about two hours. And we looked around and we realized he was still there. And he was, he was, <laughs> he was lo writing he was loving it. Yeah. And then he said, I'm just popping out. And so we sort of, we scuttled to the door and we were listening and he was on the phone to some sort of channel four execs. And he was saying, I think I've struck gold here, these two. And it just so happened that whilst he was there, we took a phone call. I think it was about Nigerian fighter jets, some fella from the Nigerian embassy trying to sell some. And we were, okay. I was going, yeah, all right, mate, send some pictures up. And then the next thing out, we saw these row of these. Um, and he was just, got, he couldn't believe it. He was, was like really excited about wow. it. Did you so, sell them? We, we, I don't know what was going on. We didn't get involved with him in the end, but everything we asked for, for the Nigerian fighter jet, including all the flight logs and everything we were getting. You wow. must have a serious <laughs> amount of like liquid <laughs> cash to be able to loan against. Well, like, you had a fighter, fighter jet. jet well, you know, I, like, well, you know, I just a I hanger. Couldn't, couldn't yeah. quite understand. Me and I were just, me and Joe were just laughing about it. And I mean, it was quite good TV, but I don't think it was ever going to be a serious loan. But yeah. it was quite funny. But the guy, yeah, so he went out and he made the call to Channel 4 and he said, I really think, I think he said, this is a cross between Lovejoy only fools and horses and something else. I can't remember what else <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite complimentary anyway. But yeah. um and then they came down and they did um they said to us, listen, we really like what you do. We like you guys together. We think it would make great TV. Um can we do a little we just want to make a like a little a half an hour pilot and we'll just show it to you. And if you don't like it, that'll be the end of it. Anyway, they put this sort of I think it's 20 minutes in the end, a little pilot together. And it was just really had a really good feel about it. It wasn't negative, it, although there were people on there that didn't get hold of the cash, you know, couldn't borrow the money. It just had a really nice feel and it would sort of been done quite tastefully. So I thought actually, yeah, this could be quite good for us. And they were talking about a one hour show, mm. you know, could they commit? So we agreed to that one hour show. They put it out on, uh, I think a Thursday night, primetime TV, which was around eight o'clock and a, the phones just from that, we couldn't cope. I mean, the net, wow. the phones melted, the internet didn't work, nothing. We had wow. to get it all raised up and Damn. boosted for the, so it could cope with the amount of inquiries that we were having. And then the ratings for the TV show just ran off the, I mean, it was millions. Okay. So they wanted instantly to cut, they came back to us within, I think about a week of it airing and said, we want to make a series, you know, a seven part or three part series or four. And then it just went on and on. And now they've made 51 hour shows. So wow. it's quite phenomenal. I mean, if you take, if you think that sort of, uh, one show takes roughly four to six weeks to make, it's a lot of filming. So they were it is, yeah. sort of embedded with me for quite a long time. Yeah. And I think I read somewhere that you, you weren't actually sort of paid a commission or anything it was like you were paid a, a fee that's relative to the amount of time it would have taken away from the business but yeah. other than that you weren't like making loads of money from the show yeah i mean they've got they're quite they're quite strict on their um you know how they can do these um observational documentaries and paying participants mm. isn't really doesn't really work and it i mean it wasn't really about the money for us well, it's about the exposure yeah and, so and clearly it yeah, worked yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. i mean it was great it was just great advertising and no they didn't they paid a location fee if they were using our store we had to shut it so there was a there was not really just about covered the X's for us. Do you feel that the show in any way affected the perception of the business in either negative or positive? Yeah. I mean, when we first um, were talking to other pawnbrokers and mentioned it to the, um, the body, you know, the governing body, the MPA and, and all their, they were very anti 
uh, cameras coming into the world of Bournemouth. Okay. And we were like, well, I don't understand it. You know, why would they be so negative about it? it was, we were almost shunned, if you like. We were, mm. we wanted the guys, the camera crew to come down to the award ceremony that they have once a year. But they were very, no, no, we don't want cameras in. As soon as that show went out and their phone started ringing, their whole perception and their whole, uh, their whole sort of um, the way they viewed yeah. the, um, the publicity changed. And gradually, obviously, some of those guys now have taken part in documentaries and um, and had their businesses um, aired mm. as well. And and now, you know, if I attend something, they all they come over and say, "Oh, it's great." Some people will say that it's the best thing that's ever happened to Paul Broken. Mm, okay. That show was aired because yeah. it's the first show of its kind in the UK. Yeah, are you go on. Well, on that note, are you familiar with Porn Kings? I think that's what it's called, Porn Kings in America. Is it the Vegas one? I think so. It's big bald guy. Yeah. Uh, what was it called? It was called. Um, yeah, not Porn King. So, I know the one. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that going before or after? Um... That was going a bit before. I think it was about a year before. Right, right, yeah. right. And was there any kind of crossover? Did you ever interact with it? Was there any sort of in that world no, or is it not UK? Really. I mean, I know the guys. I know some of the guys that know the guys in America, but I think, I mean, it's a very different thing. It's almost like, um, they're sort of almost like supermarkets, you know, those, mm. those places. Mm. I mean, our business model is very high end. So if you went into one of us, sort of very sort of like, it almost feels like an art gallery to be yeah. honest with you. And so it's a very different type of business in America. I mean, I, you know, I take my hats off to what they do. I mean, it's a very, it's, uh, it's used far more generally than it is and accepted as a way of borrowing money than it is, uh, it is here in the UK. So they've done a great job out there of, um, and they've been, they've, they've made lots of, film they've mm. filmed loads of those shows i mean god knows how many of those they've done mm. but they've they've done great have you thought about going international well we looked at some markets abroad I and mean, i just think that now we've got so much going on here and it's such a busy time for us that i'd really want to concentrate on the uk this isn't a brand that you can obviously there are other markets globally around the world and we have looked at that but to be honest with you for the time and effort that i would take me away from the business here in the uk at the moment I'm probably going to be concentrating it's definitely over the next two years mm. on uh, just sort of growing what we've got here. We're yeah. looking at other locations. We're mainly going to be set up in the southeast. We've got a new store opening in Manchester in King Street, which is going to be great for us. It's going to be a real showcase store. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're going. I mean, we've been offered franchising and licensing yeah, imagine, and all sorts yeah. of deals globally. You can imagine. And um, what, what do you think has allowed Prestige to be the leader in that field when others have actually struggled to make progress with it? Well, I think that, uh, well, one thing is the TV show that got aired is put us right at the top of the yeah. spectrum. But I do actually genuinely believe that people um, are probably a little bit wary of dealing in such a broad spectrum of assets because it's not an easy thing. I mean, I'm just quite lucky that I've dabbled in those types and I've got connections in the art world and the wine and I used to be into classic cars. So I was a car dealer, if you like. So I used to restore. So I sort of understand that. So I've got half of it batted away in my own armory, if you like. So I think for maybe some of the organizations and the way they're set up structurally with their committees and their boards, it's probably, they've probably looked at it and thought, do you know what? Let's leave that to James. Let's just do what we do. Mm. And they do it very well and they earn a hell of a lot of money. Mm. You know, some of these uh, brand, some of these organizations have got two or three hundred stores and if you look at their wow. share prices yeah they're doing phenomenal why do they really want to get involved um, and do something that doesn't quite um they're not as comfortable with sure would you recommend uh anyone who might be curious about the industry would you recommend them getting into it well i recommend anyone getting into any industry that they're passionate about if they really want to get into the pawnbroking industry and they want to handle these goods and they've got the confidence for it and the cash as well available to them or they have got access to funds then why not mm. i mean it's not going to damage i recommend i recommend it yeah entirely yeah mm. i mean it's not quite as easy as it was in 2009 to get the license you've got okay. it's, it's it's quite tight i mean but if they've got the skills and can sort of navigate their way through that and they've got some assistance uh with that, then they can probably, yeah, they can set up. How how important do you think it is for somebody to work in an industry before setting up a business in that industry? Well, I think it would have helped me tremendously. I knew absolutely nothing about the pawnbroker yeah. industry. Um, I was just either brave enough or crazy enough to take it on. But yeah. I think obviously if you've worked for, uh, and a lot of the guys that are into it or coming into it have, or setting up by themselves, 
they've worked at some of these organizations and they thought, well, actually, I could set up my own pawnbrokers. And mm. that happens. We hear, I hear that quite often, you know. Yeah. Bit of a bit of a personal one. What do you think is the maybe you have off the top of your head the craziest thing that you've ever pawned or lo loaned or whatever oh, the word God. is? Well, we've um, we've looked. I mean, if anyone's seen the TV show, we've I've been flying in. We've looked at biplanes signed by Vera Lynn. We've looked at wow. submarines. We've had Nigerian fighter jets. I've had Queen Victoria's underpants. <laughs> wait, 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 wow. wait, wait. Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> let's just go back for a second there. Queen Victoria's underwear queen victoria's knickers we've had in yeah so we've i think we've how do you value something like that i even know <laughs> oh, yeah i mean i checked them out thoroughly <laughs> <laughs> checked out queen victoria's underwear thoroughly yeah. i really inspected them yeah. thoroughly yeah. that's yeah. crazy we're good, good going over but yeah so no i mean <laughs> They were, they don't come, and they were in great condition. They had the monogram and everything. Okay. So I think we facilitated that. It was quite a while. Wow. I think we got about 12 grand for those. I mean, but uh, to me, it's not. Who's what, buying? Sorry, who's buying that? Well, they're collectors. It's I mean, what, investors can, and collectors. Yeah. I mean, right? if, if you're into um, the monarchy or you are into that field in terms of the collecting stuff you can't really get better than queen victoria's knickers can you? no you it's can't basically. i mean that's mental <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean it's some people say about the value and it's not always i mean they weren't particularly valuable i mean we've had um some collections worth i mean i've had one scroll of the quran that was worth 800 grand wow uh, but for me one wow. of the most interesting things that came in was um brian jones from the rolling stones you know, the guy who sadly died and he was found in the swimming pool at the time when the guys uh, had just become famous not long after they'd sort of um, uh, come to notoriety. He His, um, some letters that he sent to his parents that were found in a loft um, saying, and it's quite touching, it was to his mum. And it said, mum, I'm here with my girlfriend in Windsor. Um, I reckon we're going to be really famous soon. They've just got me to have my hair cut into a sort of mop. It's, it's just a, wow. And they, I've actually I've taken images of them. I've got them somewhere. At yeah. Home. And uh, we found a collector who really wanted those. And again, it wasn't. They weren't really. In terms of their value, I think they came to about eight or nine grand because we had his school tie, okay. and we had wow. um, these. I think there's about five letters to his parents, and some other little bits and pieces of his. But these letters. To read them, uh, he was writing them as a sort of 17 or 18 year old. Wow. What a cool thing to write. I mean, yeah, someone from the Rolling Stones yeah. being like, I think we're going to make, make it. it. Yeah, I think that's that's yeah. so crazy. It's really good. Do you remember your biggest sale? Do you know what that is? Like the, the biggest uh, like cash value? Yeah, I think it was just over a million quid for some yeah, a private collection. We had some coins. And wow. Yeah, wow. Coins, what? man. These coin collectors, man. Yeah, I know this. Yeah, a lot of money going Yeah. There. Um, what do you what do you get interested in now with the business? Because you've obviously been through the rounds now. You've set up nine stores, and you're almost so used to mm. the unusual aspect of what comes in. Yeah. So, what is it that keeps you interested? Yeah, I mean, I I we just touched on sort of some of the stuff. It's not always it's not really about the value of the items mm. anymore because we see so much of this. Mm. Um, you know, whether it's a home. I mean, we had a Hermes bag in the other day. We lent uh, two hundred grand against it. Wow. So. Um, it's not always about the value of, or even the brand. It's sometimes it's just the unusual stuff that comes. Yeah, like luxury's like, lost its appeal at this point. Well, it sort of as a little bit for me because I see so much of it. I mean, I still, um, I still appreciate it. But I, for me, as a business owner, in that and why I sort of went into the business is that I could come into contact with some really unusual stuff. And like we just talked about the Brian Jones uh, letters, although uh, they're not that valuable. Uh, to me, they're priceless. I mean, they're part of British mm, completely. history. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing thing to have even come across. They were found in his old parents' house mm. in the loft. Mad. So a in a little story. box tucked away in the corner. It's amazing. Yeah. And so what have been some of the, well, if not the hardest moment of the business? Well, look, um, growth and um, is always difficult because when you've got one or two stores, it's quite easy to keep a handle on it. So growing the business and being able to relinquish some control to others has been a very difficult thing for me to do personally because, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I've been, up until then, I was a one-man band. So I'd go and do deals by myself and I wouldn't be relying on other people. So that that sort of side of it, which I, you know, but they took on a lot of um, aspects of the business that I didn't really, wasn't really interested in. So mm. it was great for me, but relinquishing all that to someone and trusting, giving that um, uh, trust to others 
it's been difficult. And also funding is always a very difficult thing when you're growing as well, especially when you're growing at such a rate. So funding your business is key. It's not always easy. We know the banks are not particularly helpful in some sure. in some um, in some areas, and that's always been difficult for me. So, I mean, it grew far. It got a lot bigger than I could control. Even selling off, as I told you about my property portfolio, mm. um, it quick even that was quickly sort of eaten up by the growth. Um, so bringing in, uh, bringing in funding from other areas is, was frustrating and not always easy. Yeah, um, mm. I can imagine. I mean, even harder now with interest rates going up and everything. And that's, well, again, on the funding point, how right now in this current climate do you do you go about funding at a rate that allows you to have that margin? Yeah, I mean, we're quite lucky. We've got, we're well established, but I think for someone setting out or an someone maybe a little bit smaller it's going to be very difficult to get funding it's uh, and the banks are only going to tighten up mm -hmm. i mean when when every all the, when everything starts tumbling down which it, we're just starting to see and we yeah. hear it almost daily now mm. people coming in and uh unfortunately with what's going on with the interest rate that doesn't always affect people right this moment because most people have tied into with in terms of their mortgages. They're tied into it's a, a fixed deal. rate, right? Yeah. Well, they've tied in, and most people tie in between eighteen months and two and a half, three years. Mm. So those deals now are just starting to come to an end. I mean, I've got one myself, um, a, a property where the deal ended about eight months ago. My mortgage has trebled. It's right. gone from five hundred quid up to I think it's about mm. fourteen hundred quid. But for people that you know, haven't got the ability to find that extra money. It's going to be very difficult. And I think, and as time goes on, if the interest rates gather, you know, get, get higher or we don't start seeing the rate coming down, there's going to be a lot of pain. And I'm, I'm hearing it on a daily basis. Yeah. And I think that your business is probably like, um, not like canary in the coal mine, but whatever that sort of the first sign of something, because when you start to notice more and more people coming in, it's you know, a sign that people need access to cash. Quickly. So you're like, something's yeah. coming and yeah. your business is probably the, one of the first to kind of see it. Yeah, we're definitely a barometer in terms of that. And I mean, mm. it's quite weird because we see it, I think it in my head. And then about two weeks later, we see it on the news. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. All yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You couldn't, I could, well, we do get asked to write it, but some, yeah. you know, a quote or give quotes or, or give our opinions on stuff, which is what I'm doing here. But I mean, we, it's really weird because you sit, you do, you do, you feel it on the street, people mm. coming in and they're saying, um, you know, my interest rates are going up. I can't pay my mortgage and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And we, we, we feel it. You mentioned um, a, a little bit earlier how you said uh, now you have sort of teams of people that you hire, whether it's people to assess art or jewelry, whatever it is. But at the beginning, you were a one man band in that. But you still need to reference people. So you said friends and family are an art dealer you knew. How do you determine when to go from sort of, let's say, having an art dealer that you know, mm. who you work with as a kind of consultant? as opposed to then hiring someone who works for the shop and then is in-house? How do you justify that cost? Yeah, I mean, it's all about economics, isn't it? If you yeah. can afford to have those people on board, I mean, it's very handy that actually some of our guys that are interested in art or have some experience in art or have previously worked for some of the auctioneers have got jewellery background as well. So that's, I've got sort of both right. cases, uh, both sort of scenarios covered way there. They haven't usually got just one skill. So for example, you couldn't, hire someone who was just a turner expert sitting there all day yeah. waiting for a well, that's turn. what i was thinking yeah yeah i mean it's difficult it's a difficult one um the good thing about uh what we've sort of created and the brand is that you you phone people and if um you tell them who you are instantly they're they've probably most of them have probably seen the show if they're in a biz if they're in a field that int that we've covered on the show they've either heard about it or they've watched it and they're quite helpful actually which has been uh, I must say it's been a key to some of our successes that been the ability to be able to phone people up and talk to them and ask them their advice. And then they say, Oh, it's James from Posh Porn, right? And they say, yeah. And they give you advice that they probably wouldn't really just hand out freely mm. to others. And mm -hmm. that's been a major help. And also, you know, there might be things that uh, there's a guy that deals in banks that we speak to regularly. And the other day he phoned me up and said, well, my, uh, wife has got a Hermes bag. Would you be able to help me with it? And we facilitated a sale for her. So it sort of swings and roundabouts. So yeah. It's quite, it's quite nice. Quite like that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Do you think, I mean, you sort of touched on it when we first started talking that you were doing stuff before you set up the property business in terms of buying and selling goods. Mm. Do you think you always had that 
entrepreneurial spirit from a young age or that you wanted to work for someone else? Yeah, I mean, I always found it difficult to um, take instruction from Did others, you? to be quite okay. honest. So, yeah, I was expelled from school when I was 15. Okay. I mean, I must have been a nightmare. I was sent home. My mother, my parents okay. were pulling their hair out. But I think they, even they sort of realized by the time I was 15 that actually wasn't, I wasn't really going to go and get a job. Did they really? Did they? They okay. did. My mum said, I don't think you're really cut out for the sort of, uh, the sort of traditional work workplace, are you, James? And I said, no, not really, mum. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think... Um, and I can't remember how it came about. I think I went traveling for a while and I came back and I sort of, it cleared my head a little bit. I'd had time to, I was going out to India and Thailand and um, it sort of, I think I went away for a few months. I came back and I thought, no, I know what I really, because I, I'd been working, I'd gone for jobs in Tesco's, I've tried mm. to other, and I knew I couldn't really conform and I, I just felt that I needed to make my own way. And mm. really I'd scraped together a few hundred quid um and i started to buy and sell classic cars at the age of 17 18 and i sort of did a white out of it actually obviously because on that because you started on buying and selling and kind of just trading goods in general uh and i appreciate this is a very kind of broad question um but if you had any advice to people starting out to kind of make you know that first hundred grand i mean charlie munger you know warren buffett's business partner always says you know the, the first hundred is the hardest uh after that it gets a little bit easier do you have any advice for sort of certain uh, career paths or skill sets or anything or types of jobs or types of businesses to get that initial sort of chunk of cash, for example, that you might need for something like a pawnbroking business? It's really difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, to sort of set out on a conventional path um, in terms of a career and try to accumulate a hundred grand is very difficult, mm. I would have thought. I think you've there's an element to risk of, of risk in trying to gain that much money that quickly. And I think the uh, bigger the risk, then the more capital, then the more money you can potentially earn. But you've just got to calculate that and just put your thinking head on to think that is this, if sometimes if it's too good to be true, it is. It probably is. It yeah. is, you know. So I don't, I can't give any specific advice. If I could say go and buy gold now, guys. I mean, when the gold rush was on, for example, a lot of kids were going out and they was literally buying a little set of scales and some acid tests and they were going out and they made an absolute fortune. Mm. I mean, gold now is a great thing to get into if you, because you don't need much money to set it up. You can go and set up a little stall somewhere, get a little site maybe in a market or in a shopping center. Buy, I mean, it's, it's big business right now. So a lot of people are cashing in gold. So if you've got a couple of grand or a thousand pounds and you've got some scales and you want to go and buy some gold, that would be a great thing to do if so, you just left school or university. So that's really interesting. So I'm I'm quite curious. So so you basically you're you're talking, you buy a set of scales and then you just basically go around asking people, do you have any gold to sell? You can do it on leaf, you can do it uh, via leaflets, you can do it on the internet, you can f hand out flyers. Uh, you can get a little pitch somewhere. So I know yeah. some of these little uh, shopping centers have little kiosks that you yeah. can hire almost monthly. Yeah, I've seen um, this. I just never know how much business they're actually doing because how many people are walking into Brent Cross, for example, and trying to look to sell gold? Well, I think like now that. at the moment, because of what's going on economically, yeah. uh, there'll be a lot. I mean, we're seeing the gold's gone. It was pretty flat over the last sort of few years and during uh, since okay. sort of the last nine months, it's sort of a mini gold rush again similar to the one I told you about in 2008, sure. 2009. So you're so, basically just weighing it up, calculating how much the value of it is, and then just adding a markup on it. Well, the beautiful thing about that is that you actually don't need that much money because don't forget, you can go and cash it in at the end of the day every day. So you can go to cash for gold places. You can, well, yeah. no, you can take it down to Hatton Garden, put, send it to any melt, uh, smelters and melt it down and True. get paid out for it in cash. Wow. So you're ready to trade the next day. It's not like you're holding a warehouse full of stock. Yeah. But you need this hundred grand. So actually dealing gold, you don't really need that much money. So you can, there are a lot of people out there doing that. What what kind of markup is it on that? Like if I, if I, let's say someone came to me and said, oh, I've got this gold bracelet and I put it on my scales. How does that work? Uh, Quite well, a basic question, but. Well, I mean, it, dep you, it depends on the, uh, the individual. You can make as much or as little as possible, but people are generally wised up to, you know, gold prices. They can see yeah. it on the internet, but I think anything from a sort of 10 or sort of 25% margin uh, for your expertise and your time is a reasonable amount to expect. Yeah. To nice. earn that. So if you're buying a thousand pounds worth of gold, then, you know, to make sort of anything from a hundred to 250 quid is very easy. Yeah. We're talking about assets and I just, I'm so curious. I have to ask, cause you've obviously dealt a lot in traditional assets and then alternative assets. What do you think about crypto? 
well, look, crypto is something that I really don't understand. So to me, it scares the life out of me. Mm. You know, I've got, and I, to be honest with you, I keep hearing about people that have done really well in crypto and even friends of mine. And when I ask them how much money they've actually got, I can't see any sort of, yeah. I can't see a change of lifestyle. If I could see them, you know, they were sending me selfies in the Bahamas or whatever, and they've got, a, you know, brand new carpet. It's all about the stock they hold. And I just, it what pyramid scheme sort of springs to my head into my mind to be quite honest with you but i'm pretty old-fashioned in that respect so i've probably got it all wrong i don't understand it i wouldn't get involved with it myself yeah and for that reason i'd leave it alone but i'm sure there's there probably are people you're probably going to get calls but i know i've done all right out of it. i've cashed a loading but yeah. all i keep hearing is about how much it's how much you've actually got and how much you managed to sell mm. before yeah. anything comes crashing down right i think like, there are people out there that you hear you know they've invested ten thousand pounds and they've got their ten thousand pound back and they're letting the rest roll that's a great position to be in and mm. if you can afford if you can afford to lose your initial stake then i would advise you give it a go if you've got an initial stake you think you understand the markets why not mm. i don't understand it do you think you'd encourage kids or your kids to, to take that risk and, and do their own thing versus take a more conventional path yeah i mean i think that there's a lot to be said i mean you can't you know to just assume that you're going to do really well in life mm. uh, financially without taking risk i don't you know it doesn't really unless you're going to work your balls into the ground yeah, 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 yeah. Honest with you. so um yeah i think uh i would encourage people and young entrepreneurs to go out there and risk what they've got on a really good, sensible, well thought out idea that they had passion about. If they've got passion about it, it's yeah, important. Yeah. There's a great uh, quote that I'm, I'm sure you've heard, which is, you know, your network is your net worth. Uh, and I feel like I was saying to, to James, uh, even the other evening, I was like, I'm noticing more and more how much of an impact that actually has on my life and the people that I'm around and, and the quality of the people that I'm around. Do you, have you noticed in terms of your own success, like, the kind of people that you associate with where you're like when you're around other guys who are kind of on a mission and they're doing their thing and they're successful that that then elevates you or is it kind of more been like a lone wolf kind of vibe <laughs> i'm probably a little bit of a lone wolf to be honest with you i know the same sets of people that i knew from when i was a kid really to be honest with you i don't um mingle in those sort of circles i know there are people that go to networking events they go on holiday with these i i'm sort of you know i, I probably am a bit of a lone wolf in that respect yeah I think networking events specifically are kind of bullshit. Well, I've yeah, tried. That, I definitely, yeah. Like there's networking, but then there's networking events and networking it's events. It's organized, yeah. Organized it's, networking yeah. is just not. Like, yeah, dude. It's like when like companies do like organized fun, you know, it's yeah, like, it's, we're all going to go out and we're yeah, going to do. We're going to do this and it's going to yeah, be Yeah, we're going to do a bowling yeah, day. Exactly. And it's like, I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything in common with Sharon and HR. Why are you yeah, yeah. making us hang out? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. I've tried it. It doesn't really work for me. I've tried, I end up being rude and going home early. Yeah. <laughs> do you do, do you do much on the cultural side then? I was going to say, yeah. What's the vibe like with your employees? Uh, with the well, we've tried that, and I actually we've done a few things now where we've got together. We've done go kart with paintball yeah, and all that, yeah. and actually it is a lot of fun. But yeah. we've all got something in common. We've all we're sort of like a bit of a family, really. Well, I feel that we are, and um, it just. Uh, I think that's the not to cut you off. I think that's the difference, though, because you just what you're doing is there's a there's a kind of it's special, an activity, right? It's an, well, it's an activity, and there's a specialist interest in it, which is that you all have some sort of expertise in good. You're dealing with interesting goods every day. Mm -hmm. If you're all like accountants no shade to accountants but it's like you're all there because you crunch numbers it's not necessarily you're all bonded by the fact that you know you love counting numbers yeah, yeah, yeah. that might be a really naive thing to say but i can see why it might be more of a family dynamic when you're in that kind of business if that yeah i mean i was encouraged by the teams to, that this would be a good idea and it was only uh i think during the pandemic we first did our thing not when we were meant to be locked away you know two meters from each other but <laughs> just to clarify yeah, yeah. just to clarify that point um so yeah we did started this i think we um and for the last couple of years we've done some events at christmas but i think it does everyone feels a lot better when they've been and recently um i had a well actually it was last year last april um a sort of a birthday party where we invited everyone from work it okay. wasn't just family and friends it was everyone and that was a a really nice event i just think it everyone feels good for a while it might not last forever yeah it might wear off but everyone feels at that moment and for a few weeks after that that was a thing that they enjoyed and mm. I enjoy it. And I like yeah. seeing everyone together. And even if they're talking about work stuff or what happened to you today, or you saw signs, you know, it's mm. just great to hear all those sorts of stories. No, I think that kind of stuff's important to be honest. I know we, we touched on, you know, it, it's not, 
it's not great if it's organized and you know trying to force fun but i think actually trying to build some sort of relationship or rapport with people you work with it makes it a much nicer place to be whether it's in a birthday party or that i agree with I, I just feel like there should be some degree of and i guess it's like hard to define the line but i think there should be some degree of self-awareness in businesses where you're like you know these people are coming here just because it's a job and it's just mm. their job they want to take and that's why they want to work from home if they can mm. work from home they want more freedom if it's a job where you know you are like more involved and you've got you know a certain interest and you, you know kind of you're really there and you're enjoying it then absolutely i completely yeah. agree but there's a lot of forced fun i mean i remember there's when do you remember the um at marathon i remember skeeth and i used to work together at one place i won't say where but there was a there was a moment where there was like a presentation and uh one of the managers that was running the presentation had like a powerpoint which is already not a great start. <laughs> <laughs> and then at yeah, one point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so me and him are just like, and half the people there are taking it seriously. I'm just me and just him are just looking at each other at every slide, just yeah. trying not to laugh. And then at one point he gets to the final slide and he goes, <laughs> he goes, and remember guys, the most important thing, and he clicks it and it's a sprinter going through the finish line and it says, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And we just went, and everyone ah! just jumps out the window. At that point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was like a bingo yeah. of like yeah. the most cliche stuff. Um, just just quickly before we wrap up, I wanted to ask, uh, we, we, we do have a final question, but I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. But I'm just curious, um, in terms of how you think AI might impact your business, what are your thoughts on that? Because with a lot of businesses I can see, you know, that's going to have a pretty serious yeah. impact. But because yours is so specific, it's, you know, are there any dings in it? Is this signature forged? Is this, there's a lot more kind of a personal touch. How do you see AI affecting your, your industry? Just remind me what AI is again. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. <laughs> Artificial, oh God, that's another thing I know nothing about. To be quite honest with you. Clearly um, doesn't see it as much for it. I was about to say, yeah. 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 I'm yeah. Sure yeah. Not had, bothered. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure if it had been a thing, I might have heard of it by now, or one of my uh, guys might have heard of it. But I don't think it's going to be a, a thing for us i mean we are di we're dealing with um intrinsic uh, assets that yeah. we hold we touch yeah i mean you know we um i know there's other uh, crypto they do all this image the art with the um, nfts yeah nfts yes yeah. yeah. so we got presented with one of those the other day and i said don't even bother with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but um so i don't think that it's going to impact us to any great degree because we need to hold on to the assets i mean we get people yeah, we get people scamming us with fake um, passports, driving mm, licenses right. that people don't even exist. They're not even so that yeah. sort of side of it. If that comes under that, then that is a problem. But because we're actually holding on to an intrinsic asset that mm. we have to touch, hold, and feel, then it's probably not going to be your finger. It's not like banking on yeah. board. Or, it's harder to disrupt. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, this has been an amazing interview. Uh, thank you so much for doing it, James. Uh, last question we ask every every single one of our guests. Um, if you could give one piece of practical advice, which is obviously what we specialize in on this podcast, uh, to anyone who might already have a business or be starting starting a business, uh, but focusing on the practical and the actionable, so it could be to do with you know uh, business plans, marketing budget, anything like that, um, what piece of advice would you give? Uh, well, I don't know um, if it's that practical, but your desire for gain should be greater than your fear of loss if you want to succeed in anything that you're doing going forward. I like that. Yeah. That was clean cut. That was, that was a good shot. That's what it is. I had that one in the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Great turn down. James Constantinou, such a pleasure, man. Thank oh, you so thank much. You. Uh, where can people find you? Thank you. Uh, well, you can find us at Prestige Pawn Brokers. We've got an online an, an online store as well, which is a shop prestige. So um yeah you can find us online and in the nine locations we've got a website so yeah come and check us out amazing thank that'll you. be in the description guys yeah. thank you so much for listening and watching if you enjoyed that episode make sure to subscribe turn on post notifications so you never miss a conversation we have some fantastic guests coming up uh but right now thank you so much to james for being here and we'll see you in the next one take care guys thanks a lot thank you